Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of PG Confi U. Uh, hope you had a good sleep. And let's start. So I'm here with Diane Fay. She's going to talk to us about exploring Postgres database with graphs. Please, a warm welcome. Let's get it started. All right, hi. Uh, so I'm Diane, and I write a lot of strange command line tooling around Postgres. And this talk is kind of organized around one of these tools that I found uh, really especially useful for myself and for other people I work with in a variety of capacities. Uh, and it's really a tool for learning. So this talk is as much about how we learn and can support learning databases as it is about Postgres itself and specifically. Uh, and this tool, uh, I think, does better than our current methods that we have for onboarding people to working with a new database or uh, working your way around a database that you know sort of well or showing people what you're talking about when you discuss the structures of a database. So the tools that I think you know, we've all uh, used in the past are things like data dictionaries and entity relationship diagrams especially, which show you know, tables and relationships between them plotted on a two-dimensional space. Uh, but it's uh, ERDs uh, have some problems that we'll talk about. And the tool that I've written called PDOT um, does uh, that uh, addresses many of those problems and also supplements them with some other information that I haven't actually seen diagram before, really. But uh, let's talk about ERDs first. Um, so ERDs are what we have for database documentation in many cases. When you design a new database, you, know, you sketch out the structures, the tables, the relationships between them that you're talking about in order to negotiate your data model with all the other stakeholders. And then that's the only thing that you have that describes the database as it exists currently. So it just kind of sticks around, and it becomes documentation because we don't have other documentation to help people understand what we're talking about with this you know, particular new database. Even as that database ages and changes, um, new tables get added, old tables get removed, relationships change. Um, and you know, these design artifacts are all we have, but they are really design artifacts. So I'm kind of here to convince you to retire those you know, upfront design um, artifacts and those uh, diagrams when you're done with that design, because pressing them at, into service as documentation after the fact tends to go poorly. Um, so a few years ago, somebody named Daniela Procida uh, came up with this sort of very structuralist framework for thinking about documentation um, in a like, more organized way than I think a lot of people in the industry, myself included, you know, had. Uh, and he sort of divided it ac across two axes, the theoretical and the practical, and whether documentation serves study or whether it serves work. So your theoretical uh, documentation you know, explains principles while the practical uh, gets into specific procedures. And something that serves study is about enabling learning, about you know, helping people understand a system. Something that serves work gives you information that you need to complete a specific task. Uh, so this, I think, is a really good start to a more structured discussion of documentation. Um, even though there are things that it you know, oversimplifies, you know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, and I think this one has a lot of good points to recommend it. Uh, so, in this you know, sort of in these four quadrants, where do we really place ERDs? Uh, well, we want to use them to facilitate, or ERDs is documentation. Uh, we want to use them to facilitate work. You know, we are coming back to a database that exists. We you know, pull up the diagram as a reference for uh, you know, what we're trying to accomplish. So that indicates that it's in the serves work half, the right half there. Um, and you know, do they, the question really is then, do they offer a systematic approach to a specific problem, which is where Pochita puts the how-to guides. And they don't. They're general purpose. They describe the entire database from 30,000 feet. Um, so, Really, the best available fit at first seems to be that, yeah, they're reference material. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the most comfortable, but within you know, the two axes that we have to divide these things, it makes more than zero sense. And 
Of course, because these are de design artifacts, they're available, and availability is possibly the most important uh, criterion for documentation. So having placed them, we can look at how well they fulfill the needs that people actually have of uh, reference documentation. And you know, we have a lot of things that they don't do so well, really. Um, you know, ERDs have a different audience. They're design artifacts. They're meant for you know, data architects who are putting this uh, organization of data together. Uh, maintainers and users of the system are not really even a secondary audience when they're constructed. They become a secondary audience later on. Uh, so it's not targeted to them. Then you have like really extremely bad problems with uh, currency and correctness because databases change and the ERD lags behind that inevitably because it's a separate document. It's not usually directly derived from it or has at least to be reconstituted after making a change. Um, and the older it is, the more out of date it is, the worse it is as documentation because it gives people really the wrong impression of the structures that they're trying to work with. So they can see relationships that no longer exist, miss tables that actually do the thing they want to do. Um, then also there's a very high level of effort involved where because the ERD is this holistic diagram that has you know, all the tables and all the relationships as they were originally designed, you know, if you're trying to work you know, on a specific subsystem or across specific connections, the pieces of it that you're interested in could be scattered to the four corners with all the other tables in between them, and you have to you know, follow some lines and untangle stuff in order to understand what it is that you're trying to work with. But the biggest problem is that they obsolete themselves. Uh, so what, what I've found working with databases and with ERDs for you know, several years now uh, is that the people who work the most with the database day to day tend to you know, eventually or you know, rapidly build what you can think of as a kind of a sense of place in the database. They understand, not necessarily instinctively or intuitively, but it's something that they've navigated often enough that they build a really thorough mental model of it. They need ERDs less. And so this results in a really vicious cycle because the people who work with the database day to day who make changes to it don't need the ERD to be as up to date as anybody else. So they have less incentive to update it. And people who work with it less or who are just you know, not you know, directly database workers themselves who, but who need to understand the concepts in play, you know, then get worse quality uh, documentation out of it. So this characteristic of self-obsolescence to me really kind of calls into question the idea that they're reference material. I think that a better place may be given what happens with uh, people who build mental models and need it less is that we can say that an ERD is a tutorial for navigating a specific database. So this is in the serves study half. It is something that we think that we are trying to use to um, accomplish something specific that we're trying to do, but it's very general purpose, it, um, or general purpose within the bounds of the database itself. Um, an explanation here, for example, would discuss you know, tables and foreign keys and how those work. So it's more specific than that, it's practical, but it's something that helps you, you know, well or poorly, uh, to build your own sense of place in the database. Uh, and these category bounds are you know, very slippery. I think we should you know, avoid the temptations of structuralism. There's porous boundaries between them, but I think by and large, tutorial is really the right quadrant for ERDs that I've seen. I think it's definitely possible that there are reference ERDs out there, especially in like really huge databases. Uh, but when I've seen them used, it's always been to get an idea of how the structures of interest have been laid out as preparation for work that you intend to do there later. So they help build a sense of place, and they are less useful to you as you do build that. So we have the same criteria here. and. 
you know, how many of these are still really true when you think of them, when you think of ERDs as a tutorial rather than as reference? Well, they're still targeted to an audience of designers and not to an audience of maintainers or users. Um, they still fall out of date because the database changes faster. They still require you know, updating and untangling. They obsolete themselves, <clears throat> but that's expected through tutorials. That's completely fine. But in exchange, we get a couple of new problems. Um, you don't have a way to experiment. The ERD is a separate static document that you, know, you get you know, maybe even on paper some places still. Um, and you can't really see uh, you know, sort of what, what you see with ERD is what you get. Uh, you can add labels to it. You can annotate it. You can maybe do stuff with database comments. But those all also incur higher maintenance costs because as the database continues to change, those also fall out of date. Um, and then tutorials are about parts of a system. If a system is you know, non-trivial in size and complexity, you know, a holistic tutorial has far too much context to be comprehensible. Uh, and so you want to be able to focus on specific areas that you're working with. But with ERDs, the tools that you have available to you are things are pretty much just panning around, zooming in or out, and laboriously rearranging you know, the boxes and arrows on them to try to fit the pieces that you're interested in closer together than they are, which then also makes it less useful for somebody who's working on something different and you've just upset you know, everything that they are interested in pulling together. So what's a good tutorial? What do we want? And is there a more effective route to achieve it? You know, we want to continue to help people build that sense of place in the database. We want to be able to focus very easily, very effectively on specific areas that have like high relevance you know, in, inside a cluster of tables and relationships or of other structures. We want to make it easy to experiment. We want you to be able to you know, go from looking to interacting you know, as easily as possible. And ideally, we want it for free. Like, we don't want to have to update it. We don't want it to be something else that we need to maintain. Uh, documentation always kind of gets the short end of the stick when it comes to you know, investment of effort. Uh, and you know, anything we do here is going to be no different. Uh, and this is where we come back to you know, the tool development. So. With a couple of really general purpose utilities, uh, GraphViz uh, and modern shells, and a little bit of discipline in our database architecture, we can do better, I think, and make something that's very effective for learning. So you do need an image-capable terminal to get the most out of this. Uh, so I use WesTerm, but a bunch of others now have support uh, through a library called Sixel, um, Xterm, Iterm2, Kitty, console with a K, and there's a website, arewesixelyet.com, that has a list of terminal emulators that support images. So I do also want to talk about the reasons that this works better and is really effective for how human beings think about you know, navigation and learning, but it's a lot easier to do that after showing what I'm talking about. So I hope uh, somebody here propitiated the demo gods this morning, because I didn't. But we are going to over here, if you can see my mouse. OK. So a lot of documentation that I'm not going to explain. But um, so I'm using the uh, Postgres Air database that Hedy Dombrovskaya developed uh, as an example database. And this is a holistic ERD of that database. And you might notice it is beautiful. Like it's laid out like a pachinko machine. I'm sorry, how do you real databases don't look like this? Um, so I made some changes. That's more like it. Uh, let's see. Is that going to be better? OK. A little bit out of focus, but we can manage. Um, so the Postgres airline has undergone an enterprise migration. We've got employee records in the same database as we have uh, booking and ticketing. We've got uh, package claims, we've got vendors, we've got uh, aircraft supply, 
we've got everything in this, and it is a mess. Um, so this is a little bit closer to the ERDs that I've seen. Um, I don't like it. But here's where PDOT, I think, uh, really makes a difference because it allows you to, instead of taking this 30,000 foot view of the database, you can drop down into it and see what things look like from the perspective of a single table. So let's look at the frequent flyer tables. When you're working with a frequent flyer system, you don't care about aircraft, you don't care about vendors, you don't care so much about you know, airline employees. You care about user accounts. You want you know, passengers and their credit cards and contact methods. You want, you know, maybe you start to care about some booking, probably don't care about checked bags, but overall, this is really high relevance for the frequent flyer. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so most of these tables are things that you probably at least want to know are in your blast radius if you start making changes here. Um, and we can, you know, having adopted this perspective from you know, inside the database, we can start moving it around. So if we look at the booking table. So here, some of the account stuff that we had is out of view. You know, they've already booked. We don't uh, necessarily need their credit card information. We've already you know, taken a lot of money out of that. Um, but we do you know, still care about some of this stuff, maybe more. Uh, we also note that you know, because booking you know, r relates to an account, we can see that now employees also have accounts and use those to you know, perhaps you know, fly on a special ticket class. But overall, this is still you know, high relevance, and you know, you're able to see what the um, relationship graph looks like from a slightly different angle. And if we keep moving sort of in this down direction towards booking leg, you know, so now we start to see flight information. Uh, so this is sort of the origin table now. Uh, only boarding pass matters downstream, but upstream we've got the booking and account nexus, and we've got flights that you know, involve aircrafts and lead from gates at airports. So now the uh, sort of area of focus has shifted because now we're talking more about something that's directly connected to flights, and then that transitively brings in you know, all these other things, and we've, you know, other uh, tables that we look at from other perspective, other, other perspectives have sort of passed around a corner. And if we look at the flights table, um, you know, here, you know, accounts themselves you know, are no longer material. We've you know, completely turned the corner, and the uh, parts of the database that we're interested in are now more, much more directly concerned with you know, the aircraft and then all the stuff that happens around flights with checking bags and baggage claims and you know, provisioning for you know, fueling and supply. And we still care about booking legs because those are directly, directly related to flights. But you know, that's pretty much it as far as where we came from. So that's you know, all well and good for ERDs, but I did promise other graphs. So there are a bunch of others that are implicit in a database that PDOT is able to render spatial and help visualize. So we can think, for example, of view dependencies. So you have a view, it is a, essentially a stored query that's reductive, but we'll roll with it, that can query other views or query tables. Um, and so we uh, run PDOT uh, looking at uh, views that depend on the flight table, and we see we've actually got a bunch. Um, so uh, we can see that if we make a change to flight, that is possibly going to ripple out to employee trips and flight monitor, and then all the way down to these. We can also see um, let's, that if arriving today changes, there's only like the one dependency there. So this, this graph is secretly a tree. Um, but we can 
again, keep moving around and look at other uh, tables. So if you look at the aircraft table, some of the same views appear because they also query um, directly or transitively the aircraft table. Um, and this you know, looks like a fairly complicated view regime, and I certainly wouldn't want to have to make changes because you have to drop everything in the path and reconstitute it. But we can also see, uh, we can also filter by specific columns. And here we can see that you know, even if we mess around with the aircraft table, if we uh, look at the code column, actually, does, can I just zoom this whole thing in? Does that still work? Good enough. Um, if we modify the code column, that daily airport activity view actually doesn't depend on it. So we're able to you know, filter a little bit more effectively in views. Um, then another implicit graph is the uh, sequence of trigger cascades. Uh, triggers are scary. I love them. Um, but one thing that is really difficult is that they're kind of magic. You know, when you put a trigger on a table, it's just there, and it's really easy to forget about until you have to, until something turns up that you don't expect, and you have to go and debug it. And the more triggers you write, the bigger a problem this is because they, uh, a trigger can affect another table that has a trigger, and then that fires, and there's more functions going off, more records being inserted or modified. Um, and so this, this also is really a graph and is something that we're able to visualize. So if you look at triggers on the booking table, this is a fairly simple case. We've got an after insert trigger that sees if you're eligible for an upgrade on your account here. And you can see that this trigger function um, selects from booking and updates account, maybe, uh, if you're eligible. Uh, there's one kind of funny thing here. Uh, so this parse ratio. Uh, PDOT uses uh, TreeSitter SQL, not uh, libpq. So TreeSitter SQL is a general purpose parser grammar that is meant to be resilient, but doesn't really know about PLPG SQL control structures. It's pretty good at picking like SQL statements that affect data um, or call functions out of you know, the mess of control flow statements, your ifs and your um, raises and so on, but it's not perfect. So we compute a ratio to tell you sort of how much you should trust that this is actually a complete picture of what this trigger does. Um, so if we look at a slightly slightly more uh, intense example on the booking leg table, which is you know, you've got a flight that you know, has layovers and each flight between layovers is a leg. Um, whenever you um, book a leg of a flight, we will check to see if you have to go on standby. And if a booking leg changes, we will see if we have to rebook subsequent legs of the trip. So. Um, this one is actually recursive because it updates booking leg again. Uh, so we're able to sort of exit out and just not uh, overflow the stack here. But we're able to see that um, changes to booking leg do actually radiate out pretty intensely. So there's also a function call here. And this one is not parsed very effectively, but we can tell it does something with the flight table. Uh, but you're really going to have to look at that yourself in order to figure out exactly what it does. And then finally, if you look at triggers on the flight table, I'm glad that fit in here. That was that's pretty close. Um, so there's a lot going on with this one. You can see the booking leg tree over here is still the same. But that gets automatically invoked whenever a flight is delayed. And then also on takeoff or on a flight being scheduled, we set up the ETA of the flight in the database later on. So last and uh, probably honestly least, um, we are able to look at grants. This is pretty primitive at the moment. It's just table privileges. 
but if you look at grants to the PGA or web users, so this looks like you might expect a um, web application user to look. It's got you know, fairly broad permissions to a selection of tables. Uh, but you can also look for more detail on other users. And so we look at agent. We can see that agent is a class of employee. It inherits permissions from that and then adds some of its own. So only agents are able to um, manage check bags, um, give you credits, um, and they have extra select permissions in order to you know, do gate agent things. So that's sort of the full gamut of uh, what PDOT, or what graphs PDOT is able to present. Um, some other notes we can, let's look at something fun here. Uh, look at, so it uses graph viz to render and just sort of pipes things directly into DOT into the shell and then because we're using an image capable shell we can just output that directly to your terminal emulator. But if you run the binary itself rather than the shell function that um, invokes the p.dot binary, you can actually get a dot output. Where is my mouse cursor? There we go. And so this is a dot digraph, or the inside of a dot digraph. You can paste it into a digraph directory, um, a digraph node, and you can see here is the shell function. Um, so here's the, a template that has a digraph, you know, sets up some colors, fonts, and so on. And then everything that PDOT outputs just gets um, interpolated in here. Uh, you can also detect whether we're in a pipe or not, and if we're not, dump it out to standard out. Or if we are in a pipe, we can say, okay, this is file output, and so that lets you save uh, the rendered graphs out to PNG files. Uh, we can also do uh, mermaid format. So this looks very similar to the raw uh, dot output above, but this can be uh, stuck directly into a um, mermaid was it, a flowchart node, I believe. And a lot of uh, code forges now have support for rendering mermaid in Markdown. So you could you know, script, you know, running this, dump it out, put it in your documentation, and have it rendered, like, in your uh, code repository views. And so that is it for the demo. Let's hope this works. Okay. So why is this better besides having more graphs than just the um, relationships between tables? Um, and I think... PDOT does something really important here, and uh, Tversky gets at it here in the quote. Um, but effectively treating a graph as a navigable space, it's something that's too large to be seen at once. You have to move around it in order to build a map, a mental map of it. Uh, it forces us to do something called uh, schematizing, uh, which is to say that we exclude irrelevant information, so we filter stuff. Uh, and then also we'll even uh, distort information that's important to the task or to our goal. Like if you think of you know, drawing somebody a, an, a map on the back of an envelope, you know, they need to get someplace they're not familiar with your town or whatever, um, you'll you know, just sketch something out super quickly. And you're going to straighten some curves, you're going to exaggerate others to say, okay, you want to pay attention on this one. Um, you, you'll note a few buildings that are landmarks, but you'll skip all the rest of them. And you do this in order to you know, give them or give their memory less to manage. And this is really important because the human memory is terrible. You may have uh, seen this number before. It's possibly the most misused number in design psychology. Um, so people have taken this to mean this is the maximum number of bullet points you're allowed to have on a slide or you uh, once a uh, US state I think actually outlawed putting more than seven uh, discrete pieces of information on billboards on, on the road system um, and Mil Miller himself got called in to complain about it um, but it's really more relevant to us so uh, George Miller's literature review from the 50s 
uh, was looking at the perception and transmission of low dimensional information. So mostly things that are a single dimension, a single series of numbers, a single series of tones. And he identified a mechanism that allowed certain people to transmit more information uh, called chunking. Um, and sort of the canonical example of chunking is a telegraph operator. So somebody who's you know, very new to uh, telegraphy, which I think most of us are, I certainly don't know Morse code, um, you know, perceives this series of dits and das individually. And they you know, pay attention, they accumulate each one, and then they're able to construct a letter with it. And then they accumulate a few more and they construct another letter. But an expert at it is able to just sort of let the stream of dits and das wash over them and pick letters out. And so they're able to retain and transmit much more information because they've gotten sufficient experience and sufficient expertise that they're able to register you know, sequences as sequences rather than the individual components. And so we want to do something sort of similar ourselves here. We want to hold several parts of a database or data system in mind. And we're looking at you know, edges, which are relationships, and nodes, which are tables. Um, we want to do this to work with it. Uh, and we want also not to overload our short-term memory. Because when, you, when your short-term memory is operating at capacity, uh, you're not, any, not so good anymore at transferring things to long-term memory. So in order to keep building expertise and to become more adept and more facile with you know, the database, we need to be able to operate under capacity so that we're able to form long-term memories. But before we get into how we can apply chunking to you know, that ourselves, uh, this number is also unfortunately wrong. It's worse. Um, so Cohen did a review of uh, Miller's review um, half a century later um, and discussed the magical number four in short-term memory. So Miller's seven was really a rhetorical device, and he was having some fun in his literature review, pulling a lot of different things together, identifying common threads in order to discuss chunking. Um, it's not a what you could call a pure capacity limit, uh, because chunking is a long, assisted by your long-term memory. So the expert telegraph operator is relying on having memorized Morse code. They're very good at you know, capturing and conceiving of sequences, but they also just know Morse code. Um, and so I should say also that this number four is also still contentious. There's a lot of arguments in um, neurology of people saying that capacity is entirely the wrong way to be thinking about this in the first place and so on. But it's good enough uh, for our purposes. And so we can think of the short-term memory capacity as sort of the limited scope of our ability to focus our attention. Uh, Cohen calls out specifically something called uh, active semantic buffers which are essentially your, they're, they're slots for chunks of meaning and identifies that we give, we, our capacity tops out at about four simultaneously. So we talked about Morse code, but that's an example, not really a way to establish what exactly a chunk is. Um, we can think of chunks as uh, groups of items that you know, if you are recounting them verbally, you recite them together quickly. So in the States, we have 10-digit phone numbers. And when you have to give your phone number to somebody, you'll go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so each of those sequences of three or four is um, a chunk. And you're able to retain that for a little bit and write down the number if you have to. Um, because you're able to you know, think of the sequence, not the individual numbers. Uh, another interesting thing from Cohen's paper uh, was a reference to uh, some research from uh, Fernand Gobe and Herbert Simon uh, talking about chess. And I am terrible at chess. I'm not participating in the tournament. Um, but see Dark Van Veen if you're interested. Um, 
Gobe and Simon uh, talked about uh, expert chess players versus novices. And they identified sort of one of the, the mechanisms that experts use is to uh, have long-term memory templates that you know, are chess, chess board layouts. And so when they see a new layout, they're able to identify, oh, it's similar to something they've seen before with a few differences. But they're able to economize so much by having this layout that's a starting point with a few changes that they can remember separately that it gives them much more facility with you know, the game of chess than novices. And that is really a huge part of expertise. It's the ability to hold the system or the state of the system in mind, which you know, from the example of chess really means a very large chunk size. So you know, an entire board layout, you know, being able to have that in a single you know, semantic buffer and to have like strong long-term memory correlations with um, the chunks. And this really is what tutorials help build. And we've got chunks in database work, so these are some very common patterns that are reproduced across millions or billions of databases and that we use to construct larger patterns that are more specialized to you know, the goals of the data system that we build. But as we uh, form long-term memory associations that, uh, with the rules and structures underpinning you know, specific databases and how databases work generally, you know, we are continually improving our ability to recognize each of these and more as a chunk rather than as discrete uh, tables and relationships. And that then you know, lets us you know, leave some short-term memory capacity free whether we're identifying other items, uh, forming associations between them, uh, shuttling things in, into long-term memory. Uh, but overall, it's helping us to you know, build our sense of place in a database more economically and more quickly. And so we can uh, look at how a non-expert versus an expert might envision database structures as chunks. And so if somebody doesn't know how you know, foreign keys work very well or doesn't know how a table inheritance works, um, they have a lot of chunks. Like they've already blown past uh, Nelson Cohen's limit of four. Um, and they're kind of even further behind now because if you've overloaded your short-term memory, you're worse at forming long-term memories. While the expert, by contrast, is able to sort of identify, okay, these are things they've seen before. There's um, a junction happening here um, where an employee uh, sort of sits between an airport and a department, and maybe has an account, um, and can see that there's you know, multiple classes of employee, and they'll matter when they matter. But a non-expert who doesn't know how inheritance works can't ignore this as easily. So the better that you know both the system and the rules by which it operates, um, the more you can fit into a chunk and the faster you are at doing it. Even sort of the obvious things like inheritance do take a certain minimum threshold of understanding. So tutorials that include extra information get in the way because you have this extra filtering step. And also on a purely technical level, graph is, is worse at uh, laying out graphs the bigger they get. So how can we chunk more effectively? I mean, that's the obvious answer, uh, but we want shortcuts. Um, so like I said up front, the full entity relationship diagram is just too much for us to comprehend at once. Uh, so we get, it's easy to get overwhelmed when you're faced with the entire 30,000 foot view. But the catch with um, the diagram is that what's you know, irrelevant from your point of view, from your specific task, is going to be central to other points of view from other tasks. And so filtering then becomes really critical for working with this effectively. So there are better and worse rules for limiting. Um, the perfect is really the enemy of the good here. What PDOT does is pick a decent one and be consistent about it and then make it easy to change where your perspective is coming is looking from. Um, so 
grants, view dependencies, and uh, trigger cascades, and which also includes function references. Uh, those are all secretly trees, so a filter for relevance, you know, you have your starting point, you look at everything flowing down from it is fine for that, but it's more complicated for foreign keys. So I suspect, but cannot prove, that in a database, the number of relationships tends to increase much more quickly than the number of tables. So I've never seen a non-trivial database with a lower ratio than uh, one relationship for every two tables. The original Postgres era database is actually a little bit higher ratio, it was 1.3. Uh, my hacked up version is 1.24. Um, but there's something that happens at that one relationship for every two tables mark, where every a relationship that you add after that point likely involves at least one table that is already connected to other tables. So you get clusters, and then you get super clusters materializing where most databases look like a giant ball of yarn with a few tables and little clusters hanging out around the sides. Uh, and that becomes kind of a non-starter to deal with because um, you're just back at the full ERD at that point. So PDOT applies an additional rule of linear impact for the foreign key graph, which you can think of as being similar to uh, how foreign key cascade rules work. So if you uh, delete an airport, say it's going to cascade two bags checked, but if you delete a phone number um, over, I can't see it against white, uh, if you delete a phone number over there, uh, it's not going to affect booking, it's kind of around a corner, it's mediated through account and changes to booking vice versa, so this rule is symmetric, uh, which is good because we really want to stay Euclidean here. Um, so by doing this, we're able to cut out things that are around corners, and that's good enough to maintain really high relevance, and because you know, if you're using this in a terminal, you're able to just move to a slightly different angle and see it from there. And so you're able to shift your perspective, see it from a new vantage point, and you know, improve the relevance of what you're looking at through navigation. And speaking of navigation, uh, in Tversky's formulation, conceiving of spaces as integrated holes uh, represents kind of a different mode of attention that has its own chunking strategies that we can apply. So navigation itself is really one of our earliest modes of learning. We start navigating as soon as we start crawling and moving through space. Um, and so as we move around, you know, we will uh, chunk space by neighborhoods, by blocks, by rooms. Uh, we'll start connecting goals with chunks and goals and meaning. So the chunk kitchen can represent a bunch of different activities, objects, and concepts in long-term memory. And turning something into a diagram lets us accomplish something similar because we are spatializing you know, these um, nodes and relationships. We're putting things in different orientations with respect to each other. We're able to emphasize or de-emphasize relationships between them. We can you know, apply simplifications to the visual appearance to you know, lessen the effort of navigation to make it more efficient to schematize. Like I said, it's you know, exaggerating some things, omitting others, and um, I forget the third one. Um, so this also, you know, we don't have crossfit diagrams, just, you know, does this affect that? How does that work? So as far as addressing the weaknesses of ERDs as a tutorial, uh, we actually managed to ameliorate most of them. So. We have, we have an audience, you know, we have the specific audience in mind, we're giving them tools to learn. Uh, it's always up to date because it connects to a running database. Um, it doesn't need to, you know, doesn't take effort to update. Untangling, you're kind of limited by the capabilities of GraphViz. Um, and interactivity, you know, has an asterisk because you know, we don't have 
you know, any way to get more detail directly through PDOT, it's a pretty simple application. But if you can run it, you can also run PSQL. And besides, you know, we also show a lot more than just the foreign key relationships. But this also kind of gestures at a more fundamental question. Is it documentation? Um, and so Diataxis is about documentation, but I think it's really important to remember that that's a means to an end. Uh, the real goal that we have and that we uh, build documentation to serve is learning. So exploration is at least, I think, a different mode of tutorial or reference learning. It's got some similarities to games, almost like text adventures, like the uh, text parser, um, like most REPLs do. Um, but a main use that I have for PDOT is to use it in databases that I already know quite well, uh, but that I need to help other people learn. And learning is, uh, in a tutorial sense, really a social activity. It's something that teams undertake. Uh, individual learning, individual people going off and learning something is, in a sense, kind of an exceptional case. It you know, happens all the time. But you know, people are working over, across databases and across data systems as part of a team. They're going off and learning something. They bring back what they've learned to the group. And the group is the, therefore continually reaching a common understanding of what it is they're working with. So this takes time. And also, individual people are coming to the team at different times. They're learning at different paces. Um, so this is continually happening. And anybody who's you know, momentarily in a position of demonstrating or teaching will often fall back on another very useful tool that diagrams enable. Um, which I've been doing all along here. It's pointing. Uh, so navigation is you know, perhaps our earliest mode of learning. Uh, pointing is our earliest communicative tool. You know, as we develop uh, more facility with language, you know, that is able to express abstract concepts. Uh, it's more flexible, more powerful. So we don't point as much as you know, we did when we were pre-verbal or toddlers. Um, but we still use a couple of kinds of pointing, you know, the interrogative, you know, what's that help me understand it? Or the goal-directed pointing, you know, you should pay attention over here right now. Um, these still make very, very effective shortcuts to the work of articulation and locating something in a visuospatial field. Like, I could say, look at the uh, first word on the second line of the second bullet point, or I could just point to it. It's a lot faster. And this also is the major reason that ERDs are really useful in design. The problem is that they're not as useful after that because their scope is holistic. It's everything. And so group learning allows a full range of uh, communicative affordances, but runs into organizational constraints. You've got uh, different levels of base knowledge. People come to it at different times. And so self-directed learning is still important. Social or group learning needs to be efficient. And I think exploration strikes a really effective balance by rendering the database spatial, uh, limiting the field of view to uh, more uh, what's more memorable, what's easier to chunk, uh, and helps people build expertise with the database. So just to wrap up, diagrams are good. Relevant diagrams are better. And if you can generate diagrams automatically, uh, that supports individual and team learning in ways that I think our previous methods really couldn't. Thanks, Diane. Uh, we have time for one question or two very quick questions. OK, one in the back. All the way in there. Have you raised your hand? OK, so I have one in the end, just a second. Uh, my question is on how long does it take to create these diagrams for, a, like, for setup, if you want to set up now? Sorry? Like, how much time does creating these graphs take per run? Uh, it's nearly instantaneous. Uh, here, let's. Uh, 
Let's see. Pick a table. No, um, so let's let's look at I don't know account. We didn't look at that one. So uh, okay, didn't didn't like that. Oh, whatever. Anyway, um, oh wait, that's because I didn't specify the schema. Yeah. So yeah, just it's basically real time. Uh, the it runs an introspection query. It's very quick. Okay, thanks, Diane. We have no more time for questions. Yeah.